Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare. We're continuing with our reading and discussion of Maharaj Rahugana meets Jud Bharat, fifth canto, chapter 10. And we're up to the point where the king has noticed a disruption to his smooth, to the smooth carrying of his palanquin. And he's going to chastise the team. The team puts forth their innocence that it's all because of not them, but the individual, Judd Bart. And now the king is going to speak sarcastically to Judd Bart. King Rahugana told Judd Bart, how troublesome this is, my dear brother. You certainly appear very fatigued because you have carried this palanquin alone without assistance for a long time and for a long distance. Besides that, due to your old age, you have become greatly troubled. My dear friend, I see that you are not very firm nor very strong and stout. Aren't your fellow carriers cooperating with you? In this way, the king criticized Judd Bart with sarcastic words. Yet despite being criticized in this way, Judd Bart had no bodily conception of the situation. He knew that he was not the body, for he had attained his spiritual identity. He was neither fat, lean, nor thin, nor had he anything to do with a lump of matter a combination of the five gross and three subtle elements. He had nothing to do with the material body and its two hands and legs. In other words, he had completely realized his spiritual identity, aham brahmasmi. He was therefore unaffected by this sarcastic criticism from the king. Without saying anything, he continued carrying the palanquin as before. So in other words, he did not adjust his performance. He just kept walking and avoiding ants and causing the palanquin to be jerked to this way and that way. <laughs> and so I'm sure you noticed how the king was being sarcastic, saying the opposite things. You certainly appear very fatigued because you carried this palanquin alone for a long time and for a long distance. But Judd Bart had just been recruited. It wasn't a long time. It wasn't a long distance. <laughs> and then the king says, besides that, you, you have old age. Of course, Judd Bart was young and strong and stout. <laughs> and Rahugan is telling him, I, don't, I see that you're, 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 you're kind of weak. And aren't your fellow teammates cooperating with you? So he's saying everything the opposite, because it's, as you know, it's Judd Bard who's throwing everything off. So you get an introduction to the spiritual stature of Judd Bard. He's criticized, but it didn't affect Judd Bard in the slightest. You know what it feels like when you're criticized. Oh, it's uncomfortable to say the least. And you can get very offended, very angry when your glories are minimized. <laughs> if your body is insulted, if, you're, if someone near and dear to you is insulted, all these things affect you. But Judd Bart had no bodily conception so there's nothing to offend. He knew he was not the body. Why? Not simply theoretically, which is a great start, but he had attained his spiritual identity. So the king is talking about his body, and Judd Bart knows I'm not the body. Judd Bart knows I'm not, there's nothing about me that's fat, skinny, there's nothing about me that has anything to do with a lump of matter. 
because he had completely realized his spiritual identity. So we're not negators, simply denying this, denying that we're not this, we're not that, we're not something else. That's an essential part of bhakti knowledge. Krishna talks about it in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The soul can't be cut, it can't be dried, it can't be burned. As you know, that's negative knowledge. As for what is the spirit soul, Krishna gives just a hint. He uses negativity to drive away misconceptions and then asserts the positive. The soul is eternal. So because Judd Bharat was beyond theoretical understanding, jnana, that he's not the body, he, that means he had vijnana, realized knowledge. And this, will, this is what will make the difference in our bhakti. First of all, we need some theoretical knowledge. <laughs> Let's not minimize jnana. We need wisdom. Especially as the world becomes more tumultuous and fractured, we need wisdom to remain fixed in spiritual life amidst mm, shifting circumstances, perilous circumstances. But by our applying the wisdom, we get experience, we get realizations, and that's our real wealth. You get your spiritual experiences that become part of your personal treasury. So let's hear from Srila Prabhupada's purport. Judd Bart was completely liberated. He did not even care when the Dacoits attempted to kill his body. He knew that he certainly was not the body. Even if the body were killed, he would not have cared for he was thoroughly convinced of the proposition found in Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, Nahanyate Hanyamane Sharire. He knew that he could not be killed even if his body were killed. Although he did not protest, the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his agent could not tolerate the injustice of the Dacoits. Therefore, he, Judd Bart, was saved by the mercy of Krishna and the Dacoits were killed. In this case, while carrying the palanquin, he also knew that he was not the body. This is referring to the previous chapter where some Dacoits thought that Judd Bart was such a brute, he'd be a suitable human offering <laughs> to, for their grotesque worship of Durga, one of the forms of Durga, in, the demigoddess in charge of the material energy. Those of you who have been to Mayapur know that Bengal is notorious for Durga Puja, worshiping the goddess Kali. <clears throat> so the Dacoits, meaning the robbers, the criminals, mobsters, <laughs> they thought as I saw Judd Bart, oh, what a dumb fool, but he's big and stocky. He'd make a great human sacrifice. So that's what this purpose referring to the previous chapter. But as we're hearing, the Supreme Personality got it, intervened and rescued his devotee and killed the Dacoits. This body, his body, was very strong and stout, in sound condition and quite competent to carry the palanquin. Due to his being freed from the bodily conception, the sarcastic words of the king did not at all affect him. Have you ever had that experience where someone is insulting you and you're not affected? Someone's criticizing you? or 
you're always affected. <laughs> Anyone ever had experience where somehow or other, by some mystical arrangement, you weren't affected? Yes? It happens sometimes, and then you can see the potency of the bhakti program. And sometimes it doesn't happen, and we can see the power of our own shortcomings. We get bent out of shape very quickly. We can't forget the minimization of our glories just burns under our skin. So that's why, as we were quoting yesterday, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that the austerity of the tongue is to not speak words that agitate someone's mind. Speak words that are beneficial. So I wonder how many of you in your interactions with others, with other devotees, think about what you say. Is this going to just cause an agitation in the atmosphere? Or is this going to have some benefit, what I'm saying? The body is created according to one's karma, and material nature supplies the ingredients for the development of a certain type of body. The soul the body covers is different from the bodily construction. Therefore, anything favorable or mischievous done to the body does not affect the spirit soul. The Vedic injunction is asango hayam purusha. The spirit soul is always unaffected by material arrangements. Later you're going to hear Rahugana, his bewilderment about this point. The soul is always unaffected by material conditions. Now certainly Rahugana accepts the existence of the Atma, the soul, but he has misconceptions. Yes, he would, as I explained yesterday very briefly, Rahugana will say, well, there's the body and then there's the soul and shouldn't one affect the other? Even though we're not the body or the soul, still the soul, shouldn't it be affected by the body? And he gives the example, just like you have a pot of sweet rice on the stove, on the flame. So the sweet rice is not the pot, but because the pot's getting hot, the sweet rice gets hot. Similarly, <laughs> because the body is affected, the soul must be affected. <laughs> He's going to present his doubt to <coughs> Judd Bart in that way. <coughs> so he's, the king is speaking sarcastically to Judd Bart, but Judd Bart continues as, as before. Thereafter, when the king saw that his palanquin was still being shaken by the carriers, he became very angry and said, you rascal, what are you doing? Are you dead despite the life within your body? Do you not know that I am your master? <laughs> you are disregarding me and are not carrying out my order. For this disobedience, I shall now punish you just as Yamaraja, the superintendent of death, punishes sinful people. I shall give you proper treatment so that you will come to your senses and do the correct thing. So, as Bhagavatam explains, the head of state should be, first of all, qualified, and then such a qualified head of state can take action to discipline those who are wayward. So, it's correct that Rahugana has that kind of potency and ability, but he's misapplying it. He has failed to notice Judd Barrett's spiritual characteristics, even though those characteristics are a little bit covered, like the sun partially covered by the clouds. Still, Rahugana should have known better. But he was caught up in his Ishwar Bhava, as Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. Mm. <clears throat> characteristic of a chatriya or 
warrior in Varnashrama is that the warrior has some kind of feeling of mm, being the controller. That's exactly what Ishwar Bhava means. The emotional state of being the controller. And that blinded Rahugana Maharaj. And therefore he couldn't immediately detect the stature, the spiritual stature of Judd Bharat. So he's chastising him in this way and saying, I'm going to punish you. <clears throat> Next verse. Thinking himself a king, King Rahugana was in the bodily conception and was influenced by material nature's mode of, modes of passion and ignorance. Due to madness, he chastised Judd Bharat with uncalled for and contradictory words. Judd Bharat was a topmost devotee and the dear abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although considering himself very learned, the king did not know about the position of an advanced devotee situated in devotional service, nor did he know his characteristics. Judd Bharat was the residence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He always carried the form of the Lord within his heart. He was the dear friend of all living entities, and he did not entertain any bodily conception. He therefore smiled and spoke the following words. So again, we hear further elaboration about the spiritual status of Judd Bharat and a major mm, emphasis or spotlight on his spiritual characteristics is particularly shining on the fact that he's unaffected by the king's words, which means he has not the slightest bodily conception. When you think about it, how can, if you're not the body and you know that, how can you respond to insults of your body? It's like if someone says to Casey Marden, uh, what is it, a blue shirt you're wearing? Oh, it's lousy. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get it, the dollar shop? <laughs> I mean, you would feel a, a little tinged, but you wouldn't take it so seriously. You don't like my shirt, tough. I know it's a good shirt, you know. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say what I. I'm being recorded, so I can't. No, I'm scrubbing it out. It's not live. I can scrub it out. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, just take out the portions that. A private. <laughs> <laughs> How can we trust you? <laughs> I was going to say what what others have told me. I don't know, <laughs> but when you become a married man, then you'll have to know how to endure being sliced. <laughs> So be prepared. <laughs> what do you say, Leela Maduri? Is that correct? <laughs> Every case can be different. <laughs> what do you say, Krishna Mai? <laughs> no slices, huh? <laughs> Oh, in the early days. Okay. What does Parijata say? <laughs> and Divyananda? Daily. Daily. <laughs> uh, so, in other words, the the man has to develop some kind of detachment, otherwise he can fly off the handle very easily, right? So you, you develop, you become either thick-skinned or you just in one ear, out the other ear. I'm glad I'm losing my hearing. 
<laughs> he says he's glad he's losing his hearing. <laughs> so, yes, we can become accustomed to being minimized. We can become accustomed to <clears throat> even being insulted. It's... You can especially do that when you're not so attached to the situation, you know. But when you're attached, look out. Just like if Casey Martin was really super attached to his blue shirt and someone insulted that day. That's so out of style and uh, <laughs> looks really uncomfortable. And, but if he really was invested in having that... <clears throat> Sure, he could he could get angry. Why is everyone talking about my shirt? Uh, how dare them! I've worked hard to be able to afford to buy this shirt. I spent an hour in the store picking it out, comparing it All right, for online. I spent an hour at Amazon finding out all all the reviews for this shirt. <laughs> I'm invested in it. And now they're, they're criticizing my shirt. <laughs> Reminds me of when His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj in New York. This is before I appeared at the temple. He was speaking with Srila Prabhupada and said, you know, there seems to be some body consciousness among some devotees. There seems to be some biased perceptions based on the color of your body. And Prabhupada, as famously known, said that both persons involved in such a situation are wrong. The one who makes such biases and the one who feels such biases. Both are wrong. So this is the kind of advice that Judd Bharat will give and this is the kind of response that Judd Bharat will have for himself. Oh, it's like for Judd Bharat, the insults directed towards his body and activities are like if you started if you started insulting the life the light on the uh, on the roof here that's a stupid light i mean <laughs> who here would really get offended maybe Druva might get slightly offended because <laughs> he he picked out the light and it's the latest engineering marvel and now the devotees don't understand, they don't appreciate his prowess in getting the latest lights. And <laughs> but everyone else would think, ah, Maharaj doesn't like the lights. Well, he must be in a bad mood or <laughs> lunch wasn't good enough or something. <laughs> no, one would make a, no one would make a big deal out of it. So, Similarly, Judd Bart, you're talking about my body, but I'm not. What's it to me? And the proof that he's unaffected is what? He keeps walking as before in a very herky-jerky way, giving the king an uncomfortable ride. And the king thinks he's the body, and therefore he doesn't like being carried unevenly. Did we do the purport? I don't think so. The distinction between a person in the bodily conception and a person beyond the bodily conception is presented in this verse. In the bodily conception, King Rahugana considered himself a king and chastised Judd Bharat in so many unwanted ways. Being self-realized, Judd Bharat, who was fully situated on the transcendental platform, did not at all become angry. Instead, he smiled and began to deliver his teachings 
to King Rahugana. A highly advanced Vaishnava devotee is a friend to all living entities, and consequently he is a friend to his enemies also. In fact, he does not consider anyone to be his enemy. Suhada Sarvadehi Nam. Sometimes a Vaishnava becomes superficially angry at a non devotee, but this is good for the non devotee. We have several examples of this in Vedic literature. Once Narada Muni became angry with the two sons of Kuvera, Nalakuvera and Mani Griva, and he chastised them by turning them into trees. The result was that later they were liberated by Lord Sri Krishna. The devotee is situated on the absolute platform, and when he is angry or pleased, there is no difference. For in either case, he bestows his benediction. So you know the famous example of the two sons of Kuvera, Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva, doing what would be considered the pinnacle of delight in the age of Kali. You know, in the age of Kali, we consider their activities to be so precious, so sublime. They were intoxicated. They were wasted and playing in the river. They had the nerve to play in the Ganga, the celestial Ganga. And they were unclothed and they were sporting in the water with, with girls unclothed and everyone is drunk out of it. So much out of it that they didn't notice Narada Muni, the great sage, walking by. The girls caught on quicker and they raced to put on their clothes. But the two brothers were so wasted that they just remained oblivious to Narada Muni's presence. So Narada Muni gave them a simultaneous curse and a blessing. He cursed them you want to be naked, stand as a tree. But you'll be a tree in Vrindavan and you'll be delivered by Krishna. So it was a simultaneous curse blessing. So that's the example Prabhupada gives. So we can understand <clears throat> how a devotee simply a real devotee simply does good, even when so-called angry. Whether angry or not angry, the devotee bestows his benedictions. So now we're going to hear Judd Bart's response to all this sarcasm, all these thinly veiled attacks on him. The great Brahmana Judd Bharat said, my dear king and hero, whatever you have spoken sarcastically is certainly true. Actually, these are not simply words of chastisement, for the body is the carrier. The load carried by the body does not belong to me, for I am the spirit soul. There is no contradiction in your statements because I am different from the body. I am not the carrier of the palanquin. The body is the carrier. Certainly, as you have hinted, I have not labored carrying the palanquin, for I am attached from the body. For I am detached from the body. You have said that I am not stout and strong, and these words are befitting a person who does not know the distinction between the body and the soul. The body may be fat or thin, but no learned man would say such things of the spirit soul. As far as the spirit soul is concerned, I am neither fat nor skinny. Therefore, you are correct when you say that I am not very stout. Also, if the object of this journey and the path leading there were mine, there would be many troubles for me. But because they relate not to me, but to my body, there is no trouble at all. A very memorable and 
extremely powerful rebuttal. This journey is no trouble for me at all. It's simply about the body, which I am not. Hmm. If the object of this journey and the path leading there were mine, there would, may, there would be many troubles for me, but they do not relate to me, but to my body. Therefore, no trouble at all. So, hearing this, we may wonder, well, that's certainly an advantageous platform of life to be on. But will we ever get there? <laughs> We're having our career laid out before us. How to become free from the bodily conception of life is our first business. And then, as our spiritual conception of our identity becomes more for real, we start thinking, how can we function for Krishna's pleasure? But in the beginning, there's so much emphasis on we're not the body. I remember once in Mumbai, Srila Prabhupada had just given his umpteenth example about how we're not the body. And he said to devotees, do you know why I can always come up with all these allegories and metaphors and examples of how we're not the body? Do you know how I can always do that? So everyone was wondering, oh, wow, what, what's the secret? How, how, can, how do you always do that? And he said, because I'm always thinking about it. I remember hearing that. I said, wow, Prabhupada is always thinking about presenting how you're not the body. <laughs> so we hear the words of Rahugana Maharaj and we, we see how onto it he is. He's speaking from the platform of realization. Sometimes we may wonder where to start in our presentation of bhakti. If you go to the fifth chapter of the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, you read about Vidura's talks with Maitreya. And Vidura wants to hear about Krishna, but he has two considerations. He wants to hear about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan and outside of Vrindavan. But here are the two considerations that Vidura had. First of all, Vidura is thinking of the common person. He's thinking the common person first needs to understand that material happiness is an illusion. He says, Sukaya. Karmani karoti loko. In this world, everyone is striving for the fruits of their activities, karma. But in this effort, by this effort, they never achieve satiation. They're never, they never get satisfied to say, okay, I've had enough. No. That state never comes, so they're always wanting more in different forms, different varieties. So the Dora says they're never satiated, they're never satisfied, and they always bring about distress upon themselves. They can't avoid distress by their material activities. And he says, he adds on a kicker at the end. Not only do they always bring up, they always attain distress, but also the very process of trying to enjoy causes distressful agitation. So there's agitation in the result and there's agitation in the process to get the result. I think everyone here will agree that material activities result in distress 
and lack of satisfaction. But maybe we should think about how the very process of acting, the process of karmic activity agitates the mind. And so in that way, even without taking into account the result, you're already suffering. Your suffering begins as soon as you, and this is explained by Prahlad Maharaj, as soon as you make a plan for material happiness, that's where the suffering begins, even before you execute it. The plan-making process causes mental agitation. But we're so bewildered, we think, ah, uh, let's see, I'll do this, I'll get that, we'll, we'll go here, we'll go there. We've only just begun to live. <laughs> We start out walking and then we'll run. We've only just begun. <laughs> that very process, that endeavor, causes distressful agitation. Even in just the conceptualization stage, even in just the planning stage, this is how vicious material ener the material energy is. But we're like babes in the woods. We just, it's just, I'm just trying to be me and you know, I'm just trying to fulfill myself and you know, <laughs> find my way, find my fulfillment. What else is life meant for? We don't understand we're dealing with a vicious illusory energy. <clears throat> So we need this information from Srimad Bhagavatam. Otherwise, we're so naive. Just like those of you who are past your teens now. Any teenagers here? You're past your teens now? How old now? 30. <laughs> okay. But you remember when you were a teenager, right? You thought you knew everything, right? Why are my parents telling me do this, do that? <laughs> it was like back in the countercultural days in the 60s. They had that motto, never trust anyone over 30. They never thought that they would become 30. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous now, but yes. <laughs> Even in the early 70s, of the Krishna Consciousness Society, of the ISKCON Society. Still, for the most part, Prabhupada was the only adult. <laughs> Everyone was in their late teens or mid-twenties, very few persons over 30 years old. So when Prabhupada departed this world, his mission had to go on, so he had to give he had to create some leaders. He had to pass things on to someone. So he passed leadership positions on to persons who were actually still in their 20s. He did the best he could. He, he dealt with the, he, he used the hand of, they use a card playing term. He used the hand that Krishna dealt him and did it with such consummate such superlative bhakti that we still talk about it today. Whatever Krishna sent him, he used in Krishna's service. These kind of people, that kind of people, this situation, that situation. So especially when you're a teenager, many of you can remember how you just surrendered to your senses thinking, ah, oh, yes, all my friends are doing this. You either surrendered to your senses or longed to surrender to your senses. <laughs> I remember. Not about me, I won't tell you about me, but about my <laughs> one of my brothers. <laughs> 
I was what? I must have been 15 and he was 13 and a half. So we were uh, in our neighborhood. We were known as very serious students in a very strict Christian family. But not all the neighbors were like that, certainly. So my brother and I were talking with the local playboy of the neighborhood who would always boast of his exploits with all the girls. <laughs> Later I found out he was lying. I asked him, is all that really true? What you did last weekend and the weekend before? I was lying, man. <laughs> but, you know, we, he was like the self-proclaimed party animal of the neighborhood. And when it came to schoolwork, he would never do his homework. And he was cool. Always wore the latest fashions. <laughs> My mother would always warn us about persons like him. Just wait. Wait to see what his future is like. Because those kind of guys were making fun of us. They were making fun of my mother's children. All you guys do is study. Your mother even controls what TV shows you watch. Because my mother would not let us watch any shows uh, that were she felt were demeaning and demotivating. There was one show especially, remember? The Little Rascals? Oh, I, that was banned in my mother's. <laughs> yes, you all have seen that? No, no. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was another one called Beulah about the maid. Where's Akavir? Is he? You remember Beulah? Uh, you remember? Huh? No. Yes. So my mother said, "Up, oh, you can't watch it." She wanted highly motivated children. So she went, she warned us about the neighborhood playboys, the guys who are just hanging out on the street corner. Yeah, party, party. Yeah, I met this girl. Yeah, when we took her over to her house. Yeah. So we were there on the street corner, and the, and, and the local neighborhood playboy was talking like that. He was just a 16-year-old guy, but he had some kind of charisma, and so all the younger boys had gathered around him. And yeah, you did that, and then you did that. Tell us more. <laughs> all the stuff that, we, you know, we... we we would never dare to do. <laughs> and so then my brother started chiming in. Yeah, I do the same thing. I did this. I did that. I did that. And then all the, the boys looked at me. And what about you? Did you hear your brother? He says he does these things. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I knew what I was going to do next. What do you think I went to do? Huh? Tell mother, I said, I'm going to get my brother into trouble, you know. <laughs> he made me look bad, telling those lies, saying he did stuff that he knows he doesn't do. He'd never been to a party in his life. <laughs> so I immediately went and told mother. And oh, she was angry. Bring him here. <laughs> so my brother comes in and... My mother's looking at him with, with red hot eyes and how dare you embarrass this Christian home? How dare you tell those lies that you indulge in such behavior, fornication and other deadly sins? So I was, of course, and I was on the other side of the room just. <laughs> I was happy. He's getting his now. <laughs> and then she pronounces, like a judge, she pronounces her sentence. So now here's what I want you to do, she tells him. I want you to knock on the door of every home in this neighborhood. And when the door opens, you tell the person, I am a Christian. I do not indulge in sinful activities. <laughs> I said, yes, what a great punishment. <laughs> He wanted to be known as a playboy in the neighborhood, and now <laughs> we'll just see his reward. <laughs> so we had to do that. He had to knock on every door. I'm a Christian, and I'm here to say that I don't engage in you know, illicit affairs.
So that's the teenage life. And do we learn better as adults? That's the question. There's not much difference between the teenagers and the adults. Everyone's got uncontrolled senses. So this is why Vidura is asking Maitreya about the quest for mundane happiness. He wants to first, he wants Maitreya to first speak about that so that the common person who's not a transcendentalist can benefit and then the dialogue can shift to topics about Krishna Leela. And even before Maitreya gets to topics of Krishna Leela, Vidura asks him to speak about the Purusha avatars. Karana Dakashai Vishnu, Garba Dakashai Vishnu, Chiro Dakashai Vishnu. Why? The Acharyas say that Vidura knew that Krishna had just recently departed from the ordinary vision of the world. And it, it was too much of an emotional impact on him. Therefore, he proceeded gradually. All right, now tell me about the Purusha avatars. Instead of saying, now let's go right to hear about Krishna Leela. He was thinking, oh, it's going to be too much. It's going to be too intense. So we'll start hearing about the three Purusha avatars. Gradually, we'll enter into subjects about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan and out of Vrindavan. So the purport to Judd Bard's disclaimer that I'm not the body, so I don't care what you say, in Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that one who is advanced in spiritual knowledge is not disturbed by the pains and pleasures of the material body. The material body is completely separate from the spirit soul and the pains and pleasures of the body are superfluous. The practice of austerity and penance is meant for understanding the distinction between the body and the soul and how the soul can be unaffected by the pleasures and pains of the body. Judd Bart was actually situated on the platform of self-realization. He was completely aloof from the bodily conception. Therefore, he immediately took this position and convinced the king that whatever contradictory things the king had said about his body did not actually apply to him as a spirit soul. So Judd Bart sees a preaching opportunity. He's an avaduta, acting totally contrary to social customs and expectations. But still, in this situation, he uses it. He uses the situation to deliver transcendental knowledge. Oh, we're getting some regular verses in regular form here. Stolyam karsyam vyadaya adayascha shutrid bhayam kalir itscha jara cha nidravatir manyur ahamada shucho dehena jatasya himena santi. This is Judd Bart continuing. Fatness. Thinness, bodily and mental distress, thirst, hunger, fear, disagreement, desires for material happiness, old age, sleep, attachment for material possessions, anger, lamentation, illusion, and identification of the body with the self are all transformations of the material covering of the spirit soul. A person absorbed in the material bodily conception is affected by these things. But I am free from all bodily conceptions. Consequently, I am neither fat nor skinny nor anything else you have mentioned.
Maybe some of you remember a rhyme when you were little kids, when playing with some other kids and, you know, some little kid said something hurtful to you. You said, sticks and stones will break my bones. But what is it? Words will never hurt me. Some of you said that while feeling hurt. <laughs> well, you were doing an imitation of Judd Barrett, who actually on the spiritual platform could say such things. Judd Bart would say, sticks and stones won't bother me also, besides words. Purport. Srila Narutam Das Thakur has sung, Deha Smriti Nahi Ya, Samsara Bandana Kahan Ta. One who is spiritually advanced has no connection with the body or with the bodily actions and reactions. When one comes to understand that he is not the body and therefore is neither fat nor skinny, one attains the topmost form of spiritual realization. When one is not spiritually realized, the bodily conception entangles one in the material world. At the present moment, all human society is laboring under the bodily conception. Therefore, in the Shastras, people in this age are referred to as Dvipada Prashu, two-legged animals. Notice, Prabhupada didn't even know English was his third language. Bengali was his first language. You could say Hindi was second language. Maybe English tied with Hindi as his second language. But so poetic, laboring under the bodily conception. It's very you can just see yourself sweating and working hard under a certain conception of life. <clears throat> no one can be happy in a civilization conducted by such animals. <laughs> Our Krishna consciousness movement is trying to raise fallen human society to the status of spiritual understanding. It is not possible for everyone to become immediately self-realized like Judd Bharat. So we'll agree, oh yeah, oh, that's okay. That's, that's certain, it's completely correct. Look at us. However, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Nashta Praeshra Bhadreshu Nicham Bhagavata Sevaya. By spreading the Bhagavata principles, we can raise human society to the platform of perfection. When one is not affected by the bodily conception, one can advance to the Lord's devotional service. It's an interesting point Prabhupada is making. It's not possible for everyone to become immediately self-realized like Judd Bart. So he's letting you know, yes, Judd Bart's in a special category. But still, he says, however, you can make spiritual progress. You can make glorious spiritual progress. Nasta Praesha Bhadresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. First is get at least to the point of the mode of goodness where almost all your unwanted contaminations, almost all your contaminations are cleansed. And then by your engagement in devotional service, you can get rid of even any last traces. So often the question is asked, are devotees affected by the modes of material nature? In the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Kapiladev describes devotional service in the various modes of nature. So, we think, well, how does that apply to us devotees? Well, it depends on how much of a devotee we actually are. Are we just someone who wears neck beads and mumbles some japa occasionally? <laughs> or are we actually careful to have a spiritual perch to have an actual spiritual bhakti lifestyle. We were talking yesterday about persons born into the family of devotees. 
and Ritadvat Maharaj points out, someone may be born in the family of devotees. Anyone here born in the family of devotees? Raise your hands. Come on, put your hands up. <laughs> but you still have to choose to participate in Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan mission. You can't just enter into it just by birth. <laughs> So what do you all say? First, you have to do a few things and then later, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so often devotees ask about that. How are devotees affected by the modes of material nature? Well, it depends on how much of a devotee we are. So, one of our departed God brothers, I don't remember his sannyas name, but it was Makano Das. And he, he was walking with Prabhupada and he asked that question, Prabhupada! He had a very dramatic voice. In Bhagavatam, Lord Kapiladev says that devotees do devotional service under the influence of the mode of Ignorance, passion, or goodness. So, but I'm just curious, bro. But do devotees do they actually uh, they're they're serving under the influence of the modes of late of nature? So, Prabhupada was walking, and suddenly he stopped very dramatically and planted his cane, and he looked at McConnell and said, "Who is my devotee?" <laughs> So McConnell had to think, and then he said, Prabhupada, a devotee is someone who follows your instructions. Is he under the influence of the modes of material nature? And Prabhupada looked at him and said, no. <laughs> of course, so that, we can't take that as automatic justification for it. For whatever we do, we need to make sure that we are strictly practicing the bhakti yoga. In Gainesville, Florida, while sitting on a cot, that was what devotees had for Prabhupada in the early days when he visited. And he was sitting on the cot with his gumsha and the question again came up about devotees affected are they affected by the modes of nature? And he answered it from another angle. He said, it's like you're in a rowboat or a canoe on a lake and the, and the, and the lake has waves. The waves are rocking the boat, but they're not touching you. But if you identify with the boat, you'll think the waves are rocking me, but actually the waves are not touching you because you are fully situated in devotional service, but you haven't realized yet the waves are not touching you, they're touching the boat, or they're touching your body, they're affecting your body, but they're not affecting you, the spirit soul, just as Judd Barrett has said. The more we advance our freedom from the bodily conception, the more we are fixed in devotional service and the more we are happy and peaceful. In this regard, Srila Madhvacharya says that those who are too materially affected continue the bodily conception. Such persons are concerned with different bodily symptoms, whereas one freed from bodily conceptions lives without the body even in the material condition. That topmost stage of spiritual realization in reference to your body is described elsewhere, I think the fourth canto, to be like someone who's drunk and is acting, is doing things with no consciousness of their body. <laughs> I don't know the experience, but you've forgotten by intoxication that you have a body and you're just doing things with no awareness of your body. 
So that's said to be one of the characteristics of an intoxicated person. So that's used as an example of how someone who's fixed on, 100% fixed on giving Krishna pleasure is oblivious to their body. They're unaware of their own body. All right, anyone want to ask any questions? Well, try one. If you can indulge me. Um, in a paragraph that you read, it says that um, Judge Bharata was, and that Pingra Hogan was committing an offense because Judge Bharata was carrying the Lord within his body. But that's true of everyone, isn't it? Isn't the super soul everywhere and within everyone's heart? Yes. So therefore... A self-realized soul or a devotee who wants to make progress is very careful how you suhadam sarvadehi now, how you treat all living entities. But especially uh, Judd Bart, he was no ordinary living entity. And therefore the offense becomes even more magnified. Just like when I was talking with my mother about why when she's made some vegetarian soup does she need to put a giblet, is that what you call it? Yeah, a little tiny piece of chicken in it. Why do you have to do that? I love my chicken. And I just told her, oh, you just have a lusty tongue. Like a, when the phone went dead silent. <laughs> I told her, do you know how many chickens are slaughtered every year in the USA? Does anyone know? Nine billion a year. <laughs> Just so someone can have a little piece of giblet in their soup of KFC or something. There was a case in Florida some years ago where on the second floor terrace of a building, a young man was seen dangling a little dog over the, over the edge of the railing on the balcony, holding the dog, dangling the dog upside down so the dog's head was down and the legs were up and just, the guy was just holding the back, the back legs and the, holding the dog over and and so the neighborhood was terrified. Yes, this is cruelty. They called the police and the police searched the whole neighborhood to find the perpetrator. And they caught the guy after searching the whole neighborhood and arrested him for cruelty to animals. And you can just know, after everyone's looking out the window, seeing this incident and feeling horrified, they all go for their, sit down at the dinner table for their chicken dinners and steaks. It makes no sense at all. So nine billion chickens are dangled upside down. And they're, they're, they hang upside down from a conveyor belt by the legs and then their throats cut and then from there they go to they get scalded by hot water if they didn't die from having their throats cut they didn't die immediately they die when they get put in a scalding bath of hot water to remove their feathers it's horrible so a devotee is meant to be soft-hearted and affected by these things. But especially in the case of Rahugana Maharaj, he's not dealing with chickens, he's dealing with Judd Bharat. Even though he doesn't know it at that point in time, still he gets the reactions. And therefore he counteracts the situation, as we'll hear in the future, he counteracts his offense. He immediately recognizes his offense and makes amends. And Judd Barrett 
obviously impressed by Rahugana's reversal, delivers transcendental knowledge to him. So what started out as a disaster for Rahugan Maharaj turns into the greatest benediction for him. Anything else? I do have a second question. Okay. Um, in the purport to text 6, you said, or Prabhupada says, that Chalabharata was completely liberated and not even care when the Dakoids attempted to kill his body, you know, he certainly was not the body. Even if the body were killed, he would not have care, for he was thoroughly convinced of the proposition found in Bhagavad Gita. So, if a devotee, an advanced devotee, is praying and is in danger, why, what would be the impetus for us to intervene and defend him? He's just praying to the Lord and maybe it's his time to go it's a glorious way because the Lord is coming. So why do we have to intervene? Someone is praying for Krishna's plan. And we just mess it up. A real devotee thinks like that. Uh, Krishna can do what he likes with me, but the other devotees take action. So it, in other words, it's not being selfish. The devotee is, may say, whatever happens to me, let it happen. But the devotees, the other devotees, do their best to serve that devotee and protect that devotee's life. That's why bhakti requires some intelligence. It has such depth. So Judd Bharat, he's an avaduta. That's a, Kill me, kick me, treat me nicely, I don't care. <laughs> but in this case, with Rahugana Maharaj, Judd Bharat is taking advantage to deliver Rahugana Maharaj. So the whole point is not whether Judd Bharat lives or dies, but here's an opportunity to save this guy from ignorance, this, this king who's so puffed up. But obviously Rahugana is now no ordinary puffed up person. Because as soon as Judd Bharat speaks just a few words of wisdom to him, Rahugana jumps off his palanquin and falls at the feet of Judd Bharat, very dramatically. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. You chant Hare Krishna <laughs> and engage in Krishna's service. <clears throat> you tolerate. You've never tolerated anything before? You know what the word tolerate means? <laughs> what happens in Vietnam when it's hot and muggy and... <laughs> Gets like that there? You know what? You don't know what muggy means. Very human. Uncomfortably human. Hub hu humid. Sticky humid. You know, so hot and your clothes get drenched and you. You're a part of Vietnam that doesn't happen? Yes, but I, I experienced that too. I yeah. That too. Yes, so did you just fall to pieces? You tolerate it, right? <laughs> so that's what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Sitoshna Sukadukada Thumbs the Tikshasra Bharata. Just like the coming and going of winter and summer seasons, similarly happiness and distress come and go. You tolerate. So a big part of bhakti yoga is tolerating the material body. You have a material body, what do you expect? It's subject to all those things you mentioned, anger, greed, lust, envy, all these things. 
So when those things arise in you, you cry out to Krishna. To have a material body means those things will, those influences will arise, but you have to know how to handle them. You don't act on them and you cry out to Krishna for service. The more you're situated in devotional service, the more your senses are prevented from acting in a nonsense way. So real wealth is to have devotional service. Yes? Consciousness is always causing activity. A sentient being, a conscious being is always active. If not with your body, with your mind. Your mind also acts. So therefore the bhakti program is to use all your senses and the mind is considered a sense. Use all your senses in the service of the master of the senses. That's our goal. So your question gives me a chance to talk about Krishna and then your ears are hearing and your mind is contemplating the words. So that's devotional service. When you walk around Gita Nagari and do various activities, your walking is devotional service. When you walk to the temple and see Radha Damodar, your legs are operating in Krishna's service. Your eyes are seeing Radha Damodar. Your nose is smelling the flowers and the incense. Your tongue is vibrating the Hare Krishna mantra and taking prasad. All that is devotional service. Yes. insulting his body like what you said about the shirt um, because he knows he's the spirit soul um, and he's also the home of the super soul um, and I was told by a devotee once also I believe and maybe maybe I'm wrong or he, or he was wrong I don't, I don't remember exactly where I heard this um, that you can do things to your body that could disturb the super soul Krishna says that in Bhagavad Gita that this is actually mode of ignorance to torture the body just for some material purpose, like politicians who fast because of a political cause. They're torturing their body, and in that way, it could be said they're mm, mm, doing an offense to the super soul within the body. The human body has a particular purpose. It's meant for self-realization. That's the underlying assumption. So why are you torturing a, your body that's meant for self-realization for some, why are you torturing it for some political cause? Don't you know that within the body is the super soul? You're supposed to use your human body for cooperating with the super soul. Not that you torture the human body and engage in no service. Just like I was reading about mm, one, there was one guy in New York from East Harlem in New York City, and he, he had a rough childhood, and then he had an idea, he got into environmental consciousness by the influence of one lawyer in Brooklyn, and he had the idea to start a neighborhood composting program and he just became the composting acharya and he taught neighborhood after neighborhood how to compost and but then his mentor this lawyer who was a real environmental activist the 
the lawyer activist committed suicide and so the, this compost person just fell apart why did the how did the lawyer commit suicide he wanted to draw attention to climate change so he went into south into central park in new york city doused himself with gasoline and lit himself up mm. So that's what Krishna is referring to in Bhagavad Gita about torturing the human body and not taking into account the human body is the temple of the super soul. Of course, I think we were discussing the other night the statement by, who is it made that statement? Oh, I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, Anthony, what? Yes. So he said, just... You know of him? You don't know that? that. He's a chef. Yeah. He, he's a world chef who traveled all over the world, tasting various international cuisines and going to various exotic places. So many people said, he, oh, if I could only be him. <laughs> wow. Travel the world, eat exotic food, and yeah, and get paid for it. Get paid millions of dollars for it. Oh, if, I, if I could only be him. So many journalists confessed, oh, he was our idol. If we, if we had that lifestyle, how happy we'd be. Anyway, he said, one of his great words of wisdom was, just face it. Your body is not a temple. It's an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> Very deep, huh? <laughs> Very <laughs> Meanwhile, you read the Bhagavatam, and what does it tell you? Your body's a bag of problems. So how do you respond to that? It's negative. <laughs> <laughs> the conditioned soul wants to feel upbeat about material possibilities. You don't want to hear the body's a bag of problems. <laughs> Just like the prasad prayer, sharira avijaja, the body is a lump of ignorance. <laughs> it sounds negative but just think you're tasting prasad which is spiritual food which helps you to realize your spiritual identity but the ordinary person will think gosh these these bhakti yogis are really down on self-esteem they're really negative sharira vidya jal you know Body's a lump of ignorance. <laughs> Sometimes I speak about that uh, theme of it's body positivity. That's the rage these days. Be positive about your body no matter how you look. Ladies, don't worry whether you're big limbs or slender. Don't worry about it. Be positive about your body. Men don't be wor don't worry about what they call the six pack abs. <laughs> you can be skinny, you can be frail, but just be positive about your body. It's my body, <laughs> and don't become agitated by various media advertisements promoting perfect bodies. You know that you like your body. You're grateful for your body. That's supposed to be the latest advancement in civilization. <laughs> Counteracting what's called body dissatisfaction. <laughs> so this way illusion goes on and on and on. I always remember when I saw in New Zealand one big billboard advertising a fitness center. It just said, one body, one opportunity, one lifetime. <laughs> so all that emphasis on one body, one opportunity, one lifetime is supposed to make you concentrate and realize you've got one shot at the target. <laughs> so you've really got to focus everything in your life for hitting that target of
getting maximum enjoyment in one body, one opportunity, one lifetime. So that's what you would have done until you heard Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, last question. Yes, Hari Chakra the Prajapati. <laughs> How many? <laughs> Can't count them, huh? <laughs> how, tell us, how many? <laughs> only, only five. Huh? Only five. Five. And, grand, and grandchildren? Only two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. To make sure what? He made strategic moves to make sure he succeeded in his mission. Yes, that's bhakti. As the same with Arjuna. Krishna didn't tell Arjuna, okay, uh, I'll drive your chariot and you sit in the back and sleep. <laughs> he said, arm yourself with yoga and fight. And to fight, Arjuna had to make strategies. He had to be active. But at the same time, remember, Krishna told him, victory or defeat is not your concern. Nimitra matram bhava savasatra. You can only be an instrument. So Prabhupada, in writing those prayers, Markini Bhagavad Dharma, was praying to be an instrument. Do with me what you like. Make me dance as you want. They gave me this title, Bhakti Vedanta. Now, please make me, now please let me fulfill the real meaning of the title they gave me. So depending on Krishna doesn't mean becoming lazy or mm, apathetic or dumb. It means use whatever you have to accomplish Krishna's purposes. And know that when you do that, Krishna will make of you what he likes. All right. I thank you all very much. Hare Krishna.